This is the second of three videos about Tajikistan. The first is about who the Tajiks are in the context of Central Asia. This one is about Soviet Tajikistan, the fall of communism and the civil war that followed. And the last will be about Tajikistan today. In the previous video we looked at who the Tajiks are and how they are different to the other people in the region, especially Uzbeks, and how this was important when they were brought into the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. We are picking up the story again from that point. Although a lot of people in Central Asia say that Stalin organized the borders in a way to undermine regional solidarity, the historical record shows that it had a lot more to do with local elites trying to maintain their own power bases. What you have now are a series of crazy borders that don't even follow the already complex ethnic geography of the region, and a series of enclaves that still cause a lot of conflict. For example, Sok, which is a part of Uzbekistan, is encircled by Kyrgyzstan, but is peopled mostly by Tajiks. Still today, about half of Tajikistan's border with Kyrgyzstan is disputed. But continuing with the history, in Tajikistan during Soviet times there were all the things you know about Soviet history such as collectivization and purges. At the start of the Soviet period, somewhere between 250,000 and half a million Central Asians from what would become the USSR fled to Afghanistan and have mostly stayed. Now they're Afghans. There was also a massive influx of ethnic Russians. Between 1926 and 1959 they went from 1% to 13% of Tajikistan's population. In World War II, around 260,000 Tajik citizens fought and between 4% and 8% of the population of the entire republic was killed. Then, during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, Central Asians were a lot of the foot soldiers, so Soviet Tajiks often found themselves fighting Afghan Tajiks, and Soviet Uzbeks fighting Afghan Uzbeks. The role of Central Asia generally was to fit into the wider Soviet system, mainly as a supplier of primary resources, so that for the 70 years that it was part of the USSR, there was very little industrialization or development for its own sake. Unlike in most developing countries, urbanization did not really occur. Most Tajiks remained poor rural peasants. Four-fifths of ethnic Tajiks lived in the countryside. The urban and rural populations lived in separate, parallel worlds. Even the local secret police was run mainly by Europeans who couldn't speak Tajik and couldn't really penetrate Tajik society. Also, religion was repressed during most of the Soviet period, and though it never really went away, one of the effects of this was that the formal structure of Islam in Central Asia was decapitated, the people that could help with interpreting the scripture. Most Central Asian Muslims were isolated from mainstream Muslim society. However, on the positive side, housing, employment, education, and healthcare were universal and free. In theory as well, women had equal rights, though in what was still a very conservative culture, this was inconsistently applied. In fact, the Tajiks living inside the USSR probably had a better standard of living than Tajiks in any of the neighboring countries, be it Pakistan, Afghanistan, China, or even Iran. Given what happened next, it's no surprise that many people today look back on the Soviet Union with real affection and nostalgia. However, Tajikistan was always the poorest republic in the entire Union, and in the years just before the Soviet collapse, it was already suffering from a declining economy. We're going to pause here for a brief interlude. A few weeks earlier, I was in Kurgan Tepe in the south of Tajikistan. I started my day by getting a coffee, then going to the bazaar to check it out. Thank you very much. 
Now, on this particular day, I was looking to go for a swim, so I left town. I admired the countryside as we passed. It looks like good fertile land, but it wasn't always the case. After the Second World War, the Soviet Union had a massive need for cotton, and Soviet planners decided this valley would be where they would grow it. Most of these settlements actually date from the 1950s. Rather than bring in more Slavs and Europeans, the leadership decided to move whole villages of Tajiks to the plains. The first to be moved were the very highest villages of the Pamir. Whole villages were told to collect their things and walk to the road, where trucks picked them up. There was no Gulistan in Vaksh, nor in the early years were there any houses, food, or clean water for the 50,000 or so people who were brought here to break new land. More than a quarter of the mountain people, perhaps more, died in the first few months, mainly of dysentery and heat stroke. People killed their animals and ate as much as they could before every single head of sheep and cattle perished in the heat. The last mountain people to be moved were the Yagnobis. The Yagnobis are a tiny minority in Tajikistan, almost all living along this one river valley in the mountains north of Dushanbe. They are thought to be descendants of the Sogdians, a people who once inhabited much of Central Asia and dominated the early Silk Road trade until the Muslim conquests. There are probably around 25,000 Yagnobi speakers left. To get there, you drive up the Yagnob Valley. I'm here in the mountains just north of Dushanbe in a little offshoot of the Yagnob Valley. You can see this wall is pretty substantial behind me and if you go you can kind of see this flat area. I think this is definitely one of the smaller villages up here on this ridge. You can kind of see the structures but uh, there are a whole string there are a whole string of abandoned villages going up the Yagnob Valley, as well as inhabited ones. They're, it's not completely um, uninhabited and there are still Yagnob people living there today, but in a lot of cases the villages just aren't used anymore because nobody's there. I know some of these abandoned villages, um, the sheep and goat herders still, still go up and use them. They don't live there and I think the buildings are pretty decrepit, but they're still kind of put to use. Here you can see a much more substantial wall behind me. This looks like a, a pretty serious structure actually. It takes four days by donkey to reach the most remote villages. The authorities waited until deepest winter when the villages were heaped in snow and dropped military helicopters into the valley. They were given an hour to pack and brought directly to one of the hottest inhabited places on earth. They weren't allowed to return to their homes for 15 years. Many died, of course, but many survived, and they turned the baking hot plains, like these unirrigated hills above the valley, into this. something new whatever it was that held me back I'm sure it wasn't true holding on too long and unresolved questions holds you down what could have been a friendly smile has turned into a frown I'm moving on 
down here in this part of the south it's mostly Uzbeks and I met a very friendly Uzbek English teacher who came with me back to town. He said I was the first native English speaker he had ever met. There are also villages of Arabs down here and Kyrgyz as well as Turkmen shepherds. So, back in Dushanbe, I was walking around and talking to the camera when I had a rather pleasant interruption. One of these women called her neighbor, Hello. who was an English teacher, and invited me in. I was playing in the, I was playing in the room, my son. Why are you speaking English in the street, girl? Really? And maybe you Please can talk with him. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, where have you been in, in Tajikistan? Only in Dushanbe, Dangara. Yeah. I, is your family from Dangara or from Dushanbe? My husband from Dangara. Will you write? One, three. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. So we shall meet next time. You will visit Bahma. us. You will ring us and say, I am coming. Alex will be in Tajikistan in several days. Perfect. Getting back to the story and plot twist, the Soviet Union collapsed. In Moscow, the hammer and sickle is lured for the last time, and an era comes to an end. I am ceasing my activities in the post of President of the USSR. The tricolor banner of the Russian Republic now flies over the Kremlin. Now, the poorest country in the entire Union found itself independent. Understandably, given the situation, there was going to be conflict about what direction Tajikistan was going to take. To put the situation in context, at the point of independence, the Tajik Soviet Socialist Republic relied on Moscow for nearly half of its national budget. So, unsurprisingly, a March 1991 referendum showed that 96% of people favoured maintaining the USSR. However, for the first time since the Sassanids, Almost 1,000 years ago, the Tajiks were ruling themselves. Before the collapse, a democratic Islamic movement had already begun to emerge. This is a simplification, but essentially, on one side you had the former communist elite who wanted to maintain their privileges, allied with some number of secular people who were afraid of Islamism, and many ethnic minorities who were afraid of Tajik nationalism. On the other side was a coalition of Islamists and liberal democratic reformers. There was also a regional split between the northern part of Tajikistan centered around Hujand, which was Tajikistan's wealthiest city and the only one with any industry, aligned with the southeastern area around Kulob. These two areas had historically dominated the government. They were lined up against the poorer, more rural, and more religious southwest and Rasht Valley areas, who mostly hadn't had political power. Also with them was the Pamir region, who are culturally and religiously different, and who early on declared themselves independent from the central government, though they were fighting much more for autonomy than control over the whole country. These regional divisions had basically predated the Soviet system and never gone away. It should be said that the relative importance of these two factors of religiosity or regionalism is greatly contested, and I'm in no way qualified to weigh in on whether the civil war was about Islam or about an elite power struggle, or even whether it was just about, in many cases, a fight for survival and securing the basic necessities. What is true is that the majority of the opposition movement was led under an Islamic banner by Islamic leaders and elements of the opposition movement had allied themselves with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. But the leaders of the movement did acknowledge the culturally mixed and secular history of Tajikistan and repeatedly stressed that any changes they would make regarding an Islamic state would be done lawfully through the democratic process. The conflict rapidly became clan-based, centered on the south. Because the Soviet army had just demobilized and smuggling with Afghanistan was trivially easy, guns were cheap and vigilante groups roamed the countryside while warlords carved out their own territories. Within communities, any trust there was between people of different backgrounds completely disappeared. Alliances were local and were constantly changing and there was a lot of violence. In most places there were no policemen or ambulances to help. 
As you can see, villages were completely destroyed. Thousands of people fled in terror, and those who didn't were killed, often in the most brutal of ways, decapitated, mutilated, in extreme cases, skinned alive. The government armed pro-government militias, as did Uzbekistan, while the opposition got help from the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and probably Iran. Sometimes the Russians could be hired by either side to shoot the other one with their tanks. Most of the Russians, however, who numbered probably 25,000 at their peak, while officially neutral, were at least tacitly on the government side. As was neighboring Uzbekistan, whose leader Islam Karimov was terrified of the Islamist dimension of the conflict and the possibility of its spread to his country. It has to be remembered that running concurrently to the conflict in Tajikistan was what was happening in Afghanistan, where the Taliban had just taken Kabul. There was also the example of the Islamic Revolution in nearby Iran only 15 years before. There is nothing less than a kind of revolution being attempted here, trying to change the form of Iran's government, and unlikely to settle easily for any solution which still keeps the Shah on his throne. Daily, it has become more difficult to look at the scope of opposition to the Shah of Iran and still see his monarchy surviving. The Ayatollahs are committed to the ouster of the Shah and nothing less than that. Uzbekistan supplied ethnic Uzbeks as well as the government side with weapons, although they always denied it. Ultimately, active support from Uzbekistan and passive support from Russia was more valuable than from a fractured Mujahideen in Afghanistan and a distant Iran. Tens, then hundreds of families began to run from their villages as the mosaic of southern Tajikistan cracked and split. Intermarried families had to decide which way to go, that is, who it was safest to be. More than 15,000 houses were burned. Much of southern Tajikistan was destroyed. The conflict dragged on until 1997, but the government forces had essentially won the war after the first year. Once they were secure, the government side went on to do what Human Rights Watch has described as an ethnic cleansing of Pameris and Garmis from some of the areas that they controlled. I have seen various numbers for casualties for the war, with 100,000 dead as the highest estimate. Certainly between 10 and 20% of the population were displaced. The Tajik civil war was probably the single deadliest of all the conflicts that broke out in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. There were no war trials or commissions of inquiry and no disarmament of the fighting men on the government side. The war had been fought without armies, despite names like Popular Front. Few people had died wearing a uniform. Very large numbers of deaths had been murders sometimes of people well known to their killers. In part three, we will look at Tajikistan's last 20 years, its politics and who controls it now.